you mind plugging this on this whole office? Well, howdy! I want to say good morning to Mr. Press, and I say that every week, so I thought I'd spice things up. <laughs> We're going to dive right back into our study of what we've been looking at, and which was a back to basics. What do we believe, and why do we believe? It's imperative for us to know what we believe, and why we believe. It's not just enough to know what we believe, but why we believe. In the day and age we're living in, we are living in a very educated society. And if somebody asks you, well, why do you believe in God? How do you know that God exists? Sometimes it's not just enough to say, well, I just know. But rather, we can look at Scripture. We have other resources to prove that. We've already looked at the existence of God, how we know that He exists. He exists through nature. And we find that the fact that the moral consciousness itself testifies to the fact that there has to be a God. We looked at the Bible, which Bible is the correct Bible, why we use the King James Version. Now we're looking at the attributes of God. And last week we looked at His holiness. Does anybody remember the memory verse from last week? <coughs> Brother Peter. Very good. Very good. Anyone else? Sister Peterman? Very good. Does anybody else want to take a crack at it? If not, our memory verse for this week is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. I said to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, 6, if someone wants to go ahead and read that. sentence for the breaking of the laws. 
when we look at God, what's one thing you hear people say about God? Well, if you die, you're going to go to hell. But how can God do that? He's a God of love. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. But yet when we look at God, we still see those three main actions, uh, characteristics of government. We see judicial, executive, legislative. As we look at the Godhead, that is the executive part. In our former society or our former government, the president is the executive branch. You go over to parliament, it is the prime minister. When you look at uh, theocracy, which is a government based where God is the head, God is the executive portion of it. He is the head of it. Well, how do we know that God's not just a God of love and that he actually has a form of government set up like that? And I'm just laying some groundwork before we go any farther. Well, if we go to the book of Exodus, what's one thing he does when Moses come, goes on to Mount Sinai? He gives them the law, the Ten Commandments. And as we look at the Word of God, if God's such a God of love, how come he carries out judgment upon those who break the law? So when we look at God, we're not just looking at a God of love, which He is. We realize that God Himself is composed of love, but He still is set up, if you want to say, has those characteristics of a government. There's the judicial, legislative, and executive branches. And when we look at this, it plays more of a role because we're going to be diving more into those attributes that deal right along with those lines. Today we're going to be looking at righteousness. When we look at righteousness, it more or less deals with the legislative part of God's um, attributes. Righteousness is the imposing of righteousness laws and demands. As we've already seen in Isaiah, what is our righteousness as? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. They're worthless. They're of no good use. There's nothing good in them. In fact, if we could get a mental image and in righteousness, our righteousness was like a liquid and you wrung it out, it would just ring out black. And it didn't matter how hard you squeezed, it would just keep tripping because there's no good thing in there. It would stain the garment itself. There is nothing good in our righteousness. If someone would please find Zechariah chapter 3. And there's going to be quite a lengthy reading here to a degree. But if someone would please find Zechariah chapter 3 and read verses 1 through 8. salvation. 
he is standing there in his own, what this world would call good deeds. He was there standing as a good person. You gotta remember, this Joshua is not just anybody. He was the high priest. When it comes to the religious system, you have no higher head but God. He is the top of the chain. And the Bible describes his uh, rags as filthy. They're, un they're, clean they're unclean. They're dirty. And as we're reading here, we find that his iniquity is still there. His sin is still there. So there is no good thing in Joshua. But in verse 4, what does God say at the end? Right after the word behold. He took away his sin and he imputed or placed on him the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That in a nutshell is exactly what righteousness is. Our righteousness, our good deeds, they all mean squat. I realize that good deeds are a result after salvation. But without being saved, with still living in our sin, they are no good. You can use the excuse, well, I'm a good person. Well, when you're standing before God, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. And your own good works, your own good deeds are filthy. They're dirty. And they are nothing to be compared to in the sight of God. But when you ask forgiveness of your sins, when I ask forgiveness of my sins, God takes them away. The Bible describes that He throws them as far as the east is from the west. He places them then in that sea of forgetfulness. And He places on us the good works of Jesus Christ. And we are no longer standing there without filthy rags. Just a quick definition, even though we've already started diving into it. The placing on our righteousness, or as we might say more theologically, the imputing of righteousness, which is just simply the place of one, means this. It is a gift from God that cannot be earned or obtained through works. It is only available because of the work that Christ performed on the cross. It is a legal act through which a righteous God declares an unrighteous individual righteous through the death of his only son. That's where that legal or that legislative part comes in. God declares us um, pure and holy because of the work that Christ has done on the cross after we receive salvation. It is a legal act. It's not just something God said, okay, I want to do this for you and give it to you as a gift. But it is legally <laughs> declaring with sin, we broke a legal law. And a punishment had to be paid. And when Christ died on the cross, that legal um, penalty was paid. And because he paid it, now we can live and put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But this righteousness is dependent upon the individual's relationship with Christ. Once again, we do not believe in eternal security. We can lose our salvation. Just because we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us one day, doesn't mean that we can go out five minutes later and do whatever we want. There is still that legality. Because if you go out and sin, once again, you're breaking the law and a punishment has to be paid for it. But that righteousness is dependent upon the individual's relationship with God and it is given to the individual at the moment of salvation and it is theirs, and the key word here is to maintain, you maintain your salvation forever. Also, it is through this righteousness only that God can accept mankind as being righteous. Thus, it is mankind's only way to be accepted by God as righteous. It is a legal term. It is something that is done. We broke a legal law. A legal price or penalty had to be paid. Therefore, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for us. And when we receive salvation... He grants us His righteousness because of the work that He did on the cross. Nothing that any of us could have done, but something that only God Himself could have performed. As I've said in the past, 
if we were to die for our own sins on the cross, our sacrifice would not be accepted because we were all, we're already on. I hate to use the per word perverted, but in the sense we're unpure. We are corrupt. We are all born into sin. There has only been one person in the entire realm of history that has been born spotless and without sin. And that is Jesus Christ. And that is why He was the only acceptable sacrifice for sin. And will always be the only acceptable sacrifice for sin. Because He was a man that knew no sin. Moving on to the justice of God. Once again, as we look at the legislative side, the justice of God deals with the judicial side of God. This is, it is the execution of the penalties attached to his laws. If someone would please read Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. And someone else would please read Romans chapter 3 and verse 26. Deuteronomy 32, 4, Romans 3, 26. Please read Romans chapter 3, verse 26. Romans 3, 26. To be clear, I say at this time of his legacy, that he might be given in the different part of all which tradition Jesus. So as we look at the justice of God, it is the judicial, judicial side of God. So, so far we've looked at the executive branch of the Godhead. God is the executive of <laughs> exit. He's basically the head of the government. We looked at the legislative side. It deals with his righteousness. The judicial side deals with the justice of God. Justice demands the punishment of the sinner who may accept the vicarious sacrifice for another. If any one of us goes out into any of our communities and murders an individual, what does the law state? If you are found guilty, you will be punished. Because a wrong action occurred, a penalty must be paid. If you go down speeding through Likens at 70 miles an hour and get caught by the cop, you're going to have to pay a fine. You broke the law, so now you must pay the consequences. And here, as we look at the judicial side of God, when Adam took the bite of the apple, he broke the law of God. God said not to do it. It was legally binding. He broke the law. Therefore, we have all sinned. And therefore, as soon as each one of us were born, we were born already into a broken law. We already brought, broke the law of God as humanity. What Adam did got passed down to each one of us. And as we go through our life, we realize we broke the law of God. And because of that, we are susceptible and deserving of a punishment. That punishment is eternity in hell. But God, in His infinite wisdom and mercy, Look down before we were even created and with love said, I'm already going to provide a way. As soon as Adam takes that bite of that fruit and sin, all of humanity will have sinned. And if I require of them a punishment or a payment for the law that was broken, they'll never be able to meet it. Because they are already tainted. So I will send my only son down to take the punishment for them. And not only that, 
But He will be the ultimate sacrifice. He will be pure, He will be holy, and He will be untainted. How do we know that Jesus Christ was untainted and pure and holy? Because the blood of Adam, the blood of the man, was not in him. God came down and woman gave birth to him. And therefore, the bloodline of Jesus was unaffected by sin. It was pure. It was holy. And He was the only acceptable sacrifice. And God deemed it worthy to kill His own Son on a cross for you and I. In fact, 500 years before crucifixion was even invented, God was laying down in detail the price that His Son would have to pay for humanity. The sufferings, the groanings, the scourgings. Right there in Psalm chapter 22. God was showing to us His love, His mercy, but also His justice. God Himself is just and pure. If any one of us was in that position, we would be impartial. We would make it an unfair call. Because we all have our own biases. But God alone is able to make those decisions of what is truly just. And why is that? Because God's ways are not our ways. And His thoughts are not our thoughts. They are high, and who can attain unto it? Not I, nor you. But the more that we see this, and realize that while a government is in place, God is constantly doing everything He can to reach out to each one of us. To draw us to salvation if we're in sinning and have not received Him as our personal Savior yet. For those who have received Him as our personal Savior, He is constantly there drawing us and beckoning us even closer. And I believe His whole heart's desire is to get us to that place where Elijah was. That place where Enoch was. Where before He even comes back, He just can say, I want to bring you home with me. I'm a firm believer that it's still a possibility today. While we are waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ, when He will call the church out of this world, I still believe that if He wanted to, there's still that individual basis, that the individual got so close to God to say, you know what? I want you to come home with me now. And He just takes us away. God is so grand and so vast and so merciful. Our minds cannot wrap around the love and the mercy of God. But yet, as long as we live in sin, He is still bound, being just God, to fulfill the punishment as a legal obligation. The whole time He threw out His Son on that cross, and He's constantly trying to draw us to Him, but if we refuse His call to receive Him as our personal Savior, He is obliged by His own law to carry out the penalty. But even today, He beckons us come. And the love of God is so unfathomable. It is so pure and righteous. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 just simply lays out God's definition of love. It is pure and it is holy. And why is it pure? Why is it holy? Because its source is pure. Its source is holy. Scripture declares God is love. And if God is holy, then His love will be holy. If His love is pure, if God is pure, then His love will be pure. 
It is a reflection of who God is. It reflects His entire being. And when we look at that, it's not just an attribute or a virtue of God, but rather, as we've already stated, it is God. Love itself is God. It does not take the place of His holiness. God's holiness regulates His love. But His love is so overwhelming. And it supersedes every barrier we could ever think of. It seeks the highest good for His entire creation. How do we know that? Because Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 declares that Jesus Christ was the land slain from the foundation of the world. Before you and I was all were created, before Adam was created, God already was willing to allow His only Son to die on a cross for our sins. And when you think about what Christ endured on the cross, just that we might spend eternity with Him, I can't help but go back to those strikes that was placed on His back. Sister Dietrich, the Scriptures declare that Jesus Christ was whipped so badly that His flesh just hung off of Him. In fact, there's one verse there, Jackie, where it says that you can, and I'm just paraphrasing, it said you can see His bowels. What does that mean? He could see His intestines. Sounds like bowels of mercy to me. As he took those stripes for our healing. As he endured the cross for our salvation. As he allowed them to pierce his hands and his feet with nails. And when you look at crucifixion, for every breath they had to push off with their feet to allow air to come into their lungs. And as he did that, Brother Peter, you can almost hear him say, I love you. Brother Dennis, I love you. With every breath he took for all of humanity, it was a breath cry of, I love you. I'm doing this for you. And it is a love that is unconditional, it is unreserved and without measure. It is the highest form of a relationship between two personal intellectual beings, intelligent beings. God wanted to restore a relationship with man so badly. He wanted to have a relationship with you, Heather, so badly that he was willing to pay the ultimate price and die. Jesus Christ himself said this, Greater love hath no man than this. Than what? Than a man lay down his life for his friends. For each one of us, if we were placed in that position of Jesus Christ, which one of us in here could die for the individual we love most? And when I say die, I'm not talking about a quick and it's over. I'm talking being vegan without measure. If you look at commentaries, they will say that Jesus Christ received 39 stripes. What they fail to realize is the Jews beat their individuals with 39 stripes because they believe the 40th killed a man. The Romans were experts in death. We don't know how many times that Christ was beaten. But he was beaten so badly could you be in that position where you are being so badly just to save the one you love? Where your flesh just hung off of you? Where people could see your intestines? Where your face was being that you couldn't even recognize who you were? And you didn't even make it to the cross yet. Then you have to drag your own cross up a hill. And once you finally reach the pinnacle, you would be laying down and nailed to it and strapped to it. And then on top of that, you're hanging for three hours there in that position with your knees bent, pushing off 
for each breath. Could you do that for the individual you love the most? Or even better yet, could you do that? And would you be willing to do that to save yourself? I'll be honest, I don't know if I'd be willing to do that for myself. You think of all the pain involved, the blood loss. That's not even including the crown of thorns that was placed upon him that when pressed into his skull, blood just ran because the thorns were so, they were long and thin. That's not including the robe that was placed on in mockery that would have been placed on there it would have soaked up the blood, which means as soon as you ripped it off, it would have been as if you ripped a gauze from a fresh wound, reopening it again. People don't like to take band-aids off, much less do that kind of stuff. And when you think of that, that is the love of God for humanity. Yes, He is a just God, and law was broken. Yes, that was the legal side. Yes, there is a judicial side that says a punishment must be carried out. But there's still the love of God that says, if you receive my salvation, I did all this for you. That you wouldn't have to go to hell because I love you so much. A.A. Strong said this, Love is a rational and voluntary affection grounded in perfect reason and deliberate choice. The world we live in today thinks that love is just an emotion. One day it's here and the next day it's gone. There's no consistency to it. And when I say consistency, there's no consistency, consistency as in time being um, some stick to itness to it. Nor is there consistency with how long it lasts. It's just a feeling. But yet, love is a deliberate choice. And when we look at God, He displays that more perfectly. Love is a choice. And from the, uh, from the foundations of the world, I chose to love you. Despite your sin, despite how many times you did those things I told you not to do, no matter how many times you used my name in vain, no matter how many times you cursed, no matter how many times you stole or done this or done that, I still love you so much I was willing to send my own son to pay the price for the broken law. When we look at the love of God, there's four characteristics that stick out. It is uninfluent, uninfluenced. There was nothing whatsoever in us for God to love us the way He does. His love is eternal. It had no beginning, and it will have no end. It is self-sacrificial. Our love says, what can you do for me? Or how do you feel towards me? What are your thoughts towards me? But yet, sacrificial love says, what can I give you? How can I show you that I love you? What must I do to draw you to me? It knows no means or ends by which it does everything it can do to show that it's not about the individual itself. It's all about the other person. And when we look at God, He gave the greatest gift He could have ever given us. He paid the ultimate price that could be paid. God doesn't need gold because gold is already His in abundance. Heaven is paid with pure gold. He doesn't need pearls because there are 12 gates made out of a huge, solid pearl. He doesn't need wealth. He doesn't need glory. He doesn't even need popularity because even the sinner says His name off their lips. But what he's looking for is an individual for you and for I to fall in love with him and to make that choice deliberately. It's not just a feeling that's here one day and gone tomorrow, but it is a constant decision every moment of our life that you know what, God? I love you. I choose to love you. And because of that, I'm going to do everything I can to draw close to you. Regardless of what I feel like today, 
I'm going to do everything I can to fall more in love with you than ever before. Not only that, his love is infinite. There is no depth to which it can be fathomed. There is no height to which it can scale. And there is no length and breadth to it. It is unmeasurable, unmeasurable by any human means. Our love, our minds cannot comprehend it. Why would an all-powerful, infinite God fall in love with a corruptible, mortal, individual who's broken the law, disobeyed Him, cursed His creation? And when I say cursed, because of sin, there are thorns and thistles on the earth. The earth is no longer what it used to be. The atmosphere is no longer what it used to be because the devil set up his thrones up there. But yet God came down and said, you know what? You might have perverted yourselves. You might have corrupted my creation. But I still love you and I'm doing everything I can to draw you back to me. Won't you come? That is the whole heart of God. Won't you come closer to me? Won't you fall more in love with me than ever before? Any thoughts, any questions at this point? If not, we'll end there. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Now I pray that you should be with each one of us today. Just let us fall. Draw closer to you than ever before, for more love with you than ever before. I pray that you anoint the pastor as he brings forth the word today. Give him a special blessing. Anoint the song leader and the musicians the word as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. I pray that you prepare our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us today, Lord. That your word would fall on good soil, Lord. That we could take it with us. That we think about it throughout the week, Lord. That it would fall on our hearts, Lord. That it would remain there. That, we may, that it may grow and that we may cultivate it, Lord, into a greater relationship with you, Lord. We give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Amen.